Welcome to Faith Bridge's weekly sermon podcast. Pastor Dan Slagle is here today kicking off our series Above and Beyond, and I'm going to ask him the question, what was so shocking about the parable that he read today to the original listeners? So stay tuned for that after the service. Good morning. It's great to see all of you here today. Welcome to Faith Bridge. We're so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. You know, I have to think that a sermon series with the title Above and Beyond has the potential anyway to give your average churchgoer perhaps just a little pause, maybe even some concern, Maybe for some, even a little anxiety. Above and beyond? Above and beyond what? What does that even mean? What are are we trying to go above and beyond over? Does this mean that you're going to be challenging me? Are, are, Are you going to be challenging me in this series regarding my time, my commitment, my giving? Well, let me just cut right to the chase, folks. Yes, yes, and yes. And we make no apologies for it because that is what disciples of Jesus Christ do. They go above and beyond. That's why we gather together here on Sundays to worship, to lift our voices and to praise God and to study his word, to be inspired to go above and beyond. Why would we even gather to remain status quo? How could that be worth our time? Why would we study and pay attention to and be informed and shaped by the word of God if we're not preparing to go above and beyond. That is what it means to be a Christ follower. Jesus said, to whom much has been given, much is required. I'm pretty sure you would agree with me that Faith Bridge is not your typical church, not by a long shot. You know, from the very beginning, 20 years ago, when my friend, Pastor Ken, had a vision for what Faith Bridge would be and took the first steps toward making it a reality, above and beyond was in the forefront of his mind, that we would always be an above and beyond church. And God's hand of blessing has unmistakably been upon us in no small measure because we have understood To whom much has been given, much is required. We have to give our best for God. We have to go above and beyond because of all the amazing things that he's doing for us. And you can point to any ministry in this church and see evidence of our willingness, our commitment, our discipline to go above and beyond. Our worship Sunday after Sunday is just outstanding. Kids ministry, how I wish I could have grown up in a kids ministry like that and how thankful I am that my daughters were able to do so. Our student ministry, second to none and growing every week. Our care ministry as we seek to provide care for those that are in pain and moving through difficult situations. We're always trying to do it with excellence and we're always trying to go above and beyond because we love the Lord and we understand that's what he's called us to. In this sermon series, We're going to be focusing on our missions ministry, what God is calling us to do outside the walls of the church. Since the year 2006, we have been working overtime to make sure that Faith Bridge is an outwardly focused church, that we're not just here for ourselves. We understand there's a world out there that needs to hear the gospel. There's a world out there that is hurting and in pain There are lives out there that need to be touched and need to be changed. And so we're going above and beyond already. It's not as if our missions ministry isn't already doing amazing things for God. Seth Martin and his team, The Road, they were telling me just the other day that this year we have already sent out close to 600 short-term missionaries to 18 different locations, seven different countries, five different states. I don't know of another church, not just in the United States, I don't know of another church in the world that's doing that kind of short-term mission work. 
Peggy Burden, who heads up our local mission efforts, tells me that by the time this calendar year is over, some 1,200 faith bridgers will have gone outside the walls of our church and served in a hands-on way to meet the needs of our community here in Spring and in Greater Houston. Christy Sprague, the director of our nonprofit Bridging for Tomorrow, told me that we are on average touching the lives of 1,000 people just south of 1960 in very practical need meeting sort of ways, making sure they have enough to eat and clothes to wear, that they're learning English, that their children are being tutored so that they can be better students, so that their children has an opportunity to come and learn something about the gospel of Jesus Christ. This year, $1.2 million will go outside the walls of this church to meet the needs of a hurting and a dying world, to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going forth with power to touch and to change lives. Yeah, I'd say some great things are going on here at Faith Bridge with regard to missions. But I also believe that Jesus is calling us to more. I believe Jesus is setting the bar even higher. To whom much has been given, much is required. Just the things that I rattled off here a moment ago indicate we've been given much. And there is so much more for us to do. And so over this next three weeks in this series, we're going to be talking about how the missions ministry of this church locally, nationally, internationally can go above and beyond and make an even greater impact for Jesus and for the gospel. You've already heard that next week, Ben's gonna be back here to tell us about the awesome things that God is doing through Passion City Church up in Washington, D.C. And then on November the 18th, we have a very special guest coming. I am so eager for you to meet him. A young man who is preaching on an international platform. Somebody that God has raised up and is using in great ways all around the world. November 18th is gonna be a great day of celebration and culmination as we respond to the call of God to go above and beyond. And I wanna challenge you. My first challenge to you is to be here this Sunday, next Sunday, and on the 18th. Come and find out what we're doing. Come and find out what Jesus is calling us to do as his people, how we can respond in obedience and how we can do our part to make a difference in the world. Today, I wanna to get us started by looking at a story from the life of Jesus. We're gonna be in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. That's the third book in the New Testament. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. You can consider that a gift from us to you. That can be yours to keep. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. And we're gonna begin reading in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, 
took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this privilege that we have to gather in your house in complete freedom and without fear to lift up the name of your son, Jesus, and to worship him in spirit and in truth. We pray now as we turn our attention to your word that your Holy Spirit would come just as you promised to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen and amen. So I've read this story countless times, and I imagine many of you have as well. Certainly if, if you've been a churchgoer, you've read the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and even if you haven't been a, a Bible reader per se, you've probably heard that terminology, Good Samaritan. It's rather common in our culture. I couldn't begin to probably recount how many times I've read this story, but as is so often the case, as I was reading it once again in preparation for this message, I learned something new. God's word is just inexhaustible when it comes to truth. For the very first time, I saw that Jesus does not answer the teacher's question. The teacher wants to know, who is my neighbor? But Jesus does not give him an answer to that. Instead, Jesus responds to his question with a question of his own. Jesus wanted to know who acted like a neighbor. Who in my story acted like a neighbor? Now, why would Jesus do that? Why didn't he just give him a straightforward answer to what the man was saying? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, for Jesus, the answer to the teacher's question, who is my neighbor, was a no-brainer. Anybody in need, anyone should know that. As a matter of fact, you'll notice he doesn't even give the victim in the story a name. He just says a man. It could be any man, any person, anywhere. If we love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then anyone that's in need is our neighbor. But there's a second reason why Jesus chose to respond with a question of his own. You see, if we begin with the question, who is my neighbor? There is a tendency within each one of us to become rather selective in the answer to that question. Mm, yes, but over here, no. Not, not gonna get involved in that. And he illustrates this with a priest and a Levite, religious leaders of the day, who were operating from that perspective, walking down the road, and clearly there's someone in desperate need. But instead of understanding this person is my neighbor simply because they are in need, no, the thing to do is to walk on the other side of the road. Let's don't get involved over there. I mean, that whew, robbers might be waiting to get me. And this is probably going to get messy. It's probably open-ended. Who knows when it will come to a conclusion? And heaven forbid, I might even have to spend some extra money to get this guy taken care of. They were selective in who they were going to help, and it didn't include this fellow. And so Jesus flips it. He changes the focus, and he says, that's not the real issue. The real issue is who acts neighborly? That puts the focus on us. That requires us to look in our own hearts and consider, how do I act? Am I neighborly toward other people? Am I an individual that notices the needs of others and willingly steps into that? Or am I an individual 
who's a little more selective. The above and beyond posture of the believer is to understand my first responsibility is not to be determining who's worthy of my help, who's worthy of my assistance, but rather what is my responsibility in this situation? How can I possibly help out? What are the practical sorts of things that I could do to show the love of God to this individual? That's the above and beyond that Jesus is calling us to in these days. That's the kind of work that Jesus wants us to be doing as a church. A church that looks out and sees need and addresses those needs. From time to time, uh, when I tell people I'm a missions pastor, I'll get sort of a puzzled look and they'll ask me, so what, what exactly does a missions pastor do? And it's really rather simple. Myself, Seth and the road, Peggy and our local missions, Christy and Bridging for Tomorrow, all of us from a staff perspective understand that we have three primary responsibilities. Number one, we are to go out and locate needs. We're to be looking for opportunities to serve, to go above and beyond, to show the love of Jesus in practical ways. Number two, our responsibility is to make you, the body of Christ, aware of those needs, to bring them to your attention so that you know and understand this is a need that exists. Because we understand that people are busy living lives. They have jobs. They have kids to raise. They have all sorts of responsibilities. And part of our service to you is making you aware of those needs. And then number three giving you opportunities to meet those needs. Paving the way, if you will, on ramps for service. Discovering the needs, making you aware of the needs, and then giving you opportunity to meet those needs. For example, on a local level, one of our partners is May's Closet. May's Closet. This is a unique ministry in that it serves foster kids. That's why they exist. Specifically, they provide clothing for foster kids. You may not be aware of it, but most kids who are in the foster system have about one or two changes of clothes at most because they don't have a mom and a dad to take them out on a shopping trip like we would do with our children. No, they're just packing up and moving from home to home. And by the way, you may not be aware of it, but Klein ISD has a higher rate of foster kids than any other ISD in the entire state of Texas. There is a huge concentration of foster kids right here. And so we partnered with May Closet a few months ago, and we set up a shopping spree opportunity right here at the church. And on a Saturday, these foster kids were able to come up and do what other kids do a lot. Look for some new clothes. Look for some opportunities to get some shoes, pants, shirts, dresses, blouses, so on and so forth. And it was an awesome day. One 13-year-old girl, it just happened to be her birthday. She came up here. And she literally skipped out of this place saying, this was the greatest birthday of my life. I have never had 10 things of my own. One young man who's 16 years old came up here and he was on a mission because he was counting on the fact that this would be the year that he would get to go to homecoming. And he wanted to make sure that he looked good, but he had never owned a suit or anything of the sort in his life. He didn't even know where to begin. But a Faith Bridge dad, a volunteer, Corbin Bates, took him off to the side and said, let's, let's see how we can get you spiffied up here a little bit. Helped him pick out a blazer and some slacks and a tie. And he taught him how to tie the tie because he had never owned one before. 
Those are the kinds of things that we and our children take for granted. But those are the kinds of things that scream out loud to foster kids, you're my neighbor. You're my neighbor because you're treating me like a neighbor would treat someone. You're loving me and you're showing me the love of Jesus in very practical, life-changing sorts of ways. We're going above and beyond, not, not just right here in the Spring Houston area, but on a national level too. That is why we are so vested in what Ben is doing in Washington, D.C. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but by partnering with Ben and by investing in the work that he's doing there, we have an opportunity to influence the most important city in the world. Multiply our influence infinitely as we influence that town with the gospel of Jesus. I was up there about a month ago and just had a blast worshiping with Ben and the hundreds of folks that he's pulled together. And after the service, I was visiting with a handful of them and frankly was just taken aback at the positions of influence these young people, and they are primarily young folks, that they have. I met two guys who work in the Secret Service. I met any number of young people who serve on the staffs of senators and representatives. I met a very sharp young Marine who serves at the Pentagon doing classified work. He said, Dan, I can't tell you what I do. I'd have to kill you <laughs> if I did. I even met a young lady who is Vice President Mike Pence's personal secretary and talked him into coming to church one Sunday at Ben's church. Amen. Yeah. We have an opportunity through these young people and through their ministry to influence not just the most important city in the world, but some of the most powerful people in the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to steal his fire. Ben will be here next week to tell you even more about what's going on there. But you get the point. We're going above and beyond nationally because we understand we have a responsibility beyond our hometown, beyond Houston. And there's no more strategic place, we don't think, than in Washington, D.C. And we're going above and beyond internationally as well. Back in 2006, when I first stepped into this role, one of the first partnerships that we formed internationally was with a ministry in Honduras called Hope for Honduras. Hope for Honduras is located in the worst slum of the capital city of Honduras, Tegucigalpa. Hundreds of families that live in the worst sorts of conditions. Ron and Shelley waded right into that mess and established a thriving ministry meeting the needs of those people. In 2009, three years later, we made the strategic decision that we were going to work with Hope for Honduras to establish a school. Now, they do have schools, but we decided to establish another one for two reasons. Number one, the public schools there are atrocious. They're basically just big daycare opportunities. But secondly... We understand that the only hope these kids have to get out of the big mess that they're in is through education, through learning, and through growing. We established a school there because we understand that Jesus has called us to go and to serve. You know, it's all over the news right now. Unless you've been living under a rock, you're very much aware that there's a caravan of immigrants headed this way from Central America. And folks are wringing their hands and wondering, you know, what's going to happen when they get here? And I don't know what's going to happen, but here's what I do know. I'm not aware of a single verse in this Bible where Jesus says, wait for them to come to you. No, Jesus says, go. Don't wait for the people who are hurting to show up at your doorstep, you get out and you go. And you go above and beyond and you serve. And that's why we established Hope Academy there. And one of the 
clearest memories I have of the establishment of Hope Academy is one of the first students. His name is Omar. Omar, yeah, there he is, little stinker. <laughs> now, here's why I remember him. Because his idea of a good time was to sneak up behind Pastor Dan when he wasn't looking and bow, slap me right across the back of my head and then run for his life. <laughs> no surprise, Omar thought that was fun because Omar and his two siblings, his sister Lauren and his brother Anderson, were among the poorest of the poor in that slum. They lived in a shack, and that's all you could call it, a clapboard shack, with their mother and with their alcoholic, abusive father, who picked a different one each day to beat up, mom or one of the kids. That's all they knew about home life. And when they weren't getting beat up by dad, MS-13, the incredibly violent gang, was always on a street corner recruiting, even threatening kids. If you don't join, it's gonna cost you your life. We'll kill your mother. But Omar and his siblings had a couple of things going for them. Number one, they had a mom who wasn't about to let their kids go down the drain of poverty. They were gonna, she was gonna do whatever she had to do to keep them in school. She knew that was their ticket out. But the second thing they had going for them was a faith bridger. Dr. David Way went down there with me in 2009 and he met Omar and his siblings and he decided, you know what? I'm gonna make sure they get that education. We provided the school, but we also have to provide sponsorships for the kids to go. It costs money to pay for faculty and for books and all of those sorts of things. And so he takes on this family and he gets them in school and he keeps them there. Now, nine years later, Anderson is a graduate of the police academy in Tegucigalpa and serves as a police officer helping to keep order in a crazy town. He's not living in a slum anymore. Lauren, his sister, is a student at the Catholic University studying psychology because she wants to be a counselor one day to help kids who are raised like she was raised. What about Omar? Well, Omar graduated and he got accepted to university. And wouldn't you know it, the very year he got accepted, there was a teacher strike For 12 months, teachers didn't show up. So he might as well have not even been accepted. And that would have been the time for Omar to go off the rails. His life had been pretty well directed by Hope Academy up to that point. And the next logical step was university, but poof, that's gone. And MS-13 was right there in the wings. But thanks be to God, and thanks be to faith bridgers like Dr. Way who go above and beyond He didn't do that. Now, he went back to the Hope Academy and he approached Ron and Shelly and he said, I got got a proposition for you. How about if I come back and I work for you as a mentor? How about if I provide for the kids that are coming along behind me what you provided for me? And they said, yeah, we'll do that. And they took a chance on him. And that's what he's been doing. And this year... University opened back up, and he's in school learning to be a linguist of all things. He loves languages, and he has an aptitude for languages, and his goal is to go to the United Nations as a translator one day. Why did that happen? Because Faith Bridge and Faith Bridgers were willing to go above and beyond. You know, there's one picture in particular I wanted you to see. There he is with his compatriot teacher. It's a picture of him and Dr. Way together. Man, I love that picture. I love that picture because it screams right out loud. If somebody will go above and beyond, a life can be changed. You'll never see Omar or Anderson or Lauren in a caravan of immigrants coming to the U.S. border. You know why? 
because somebody went above and beyond. Faith Bridge went above and beyond and they went. They didn't wait, they went and they demonstrated that the God of hope can provide for them right where they are. And there's hope right where they are and they can make a difference right where they are. That's why you won't see them in that immigrant caravan. And that's why Jesus is calling us to go above and beyond. We're not called to be a church of hand ringers who sit around and wait and wonder. No, we've been called to go. And that's why we have this sermon series. And that's why we're going to be challenging you to step up to the plate. Step up to the plate in terms of your commitment. Are you making yourself aware? Are you listening to the things that your missions ministry is telling you? We're going to call you to go above and beyond in terms of your going. Have you considered a short-term mission trip? Have you considered giving Peggy a call and finding out how can I serve in local mission? Have you thought about going down to Bridging for Tomorrow and helping those less fortunate folks? And we're going to call you to go above and beyond with your giving as well. Friends, we got a God-sized goal ahead of us. We didn't think there was any point in setting a goal if it wasn't God-sized. We didn't want to do anything that we could just do on our own. No, this is going to call for God to intervene and work in our hearts and work in our wallets. Over the next three weeks, we believe that God is calling us to raise $500,000 to make a difference locally, nationally, and internationally. This isn't a pledge for next year. No, this is over a three-week period, a half a million dollars. You say, half a million, where is that going to go? I'll tell you. Part of it is going to go to our local partnerships. You know, we're approaching the most difficult, needy time of the year. So many needs are out there. And so we're raising money for our local ministries. Another part of it is going to go to Ben and to Passion City Church. They need help. He's got hundreds of young people coming, but that's part of the problem. They're young and they ain't got any money. <laughs> and they're still growing and learning how to give. So we need to be there for Ben and for that church. And part of it is going to go to our ministries in Central America. Hope for Honduras isn't the only ministry that we support down there. We have another partner in El Salvador, my father's house, another ministry that's changing the lives of children, children who would otherwise be in trafficking or brutalized on the streets of San Salvador, to whom much has been given, much is required. We take that so seriously here. And so we're issuing the challenge to you. And we know we can do it. Not a doubt in my mind that this congregation can step up and meet that challenge over the next three weeks. And I can't wait until the 18th gets here and we can all stand on our feet and say, yay, God. We are amazed at what you have done in our midst. Toward that end, I want us to close the service in a very special way, a, a, a special time of giving back to God. Now, I know various ones of you with your gray volunteer shirts on, you may have to step out and go perform your service, but I would like, please, for the rest of us to honor this as a sacred moment and stay seated in your bulletin, you had two envelopes. The first one was our regular giving envelope, the one that you use for your regular weekly or, or monthly giving. We want you, of course, to go ahead and, and make that contribution to keep things running right here at home. But if you're prepared today, there's another envelope, which is our above and beyond. And we would like to kick this off today. And you can write a check and put it in here. If you need an envelope, didn't get one, just raise your hand. I see our ushers are passing them out. If you can do that today, make your check out to Faith Bridge, not to any one of our partner ministries. Just make it out to Faith Bridge. We're going to make sure it gets to where it needs to go. Put it in the envelope, and then shortly when we give back to God, you can put both of those envelopes in. If you're not prepared to give today, and I understand if you need to go home and pray about it, talk to your family about it, decide what you want to do, that's fine. You can also give online. 
faithbridge.org slash beyond. And you can go to the drop down menu above and beyond and you can give that way online. But there'll be other opportunities over the next two weeks as well. I don't know about you, but I am so excited about what God is doing in our midst and what he is going to do. And so we're going to close this service by giving back to God. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And then after I pray, you're going to see a very special video about one of our local partners and the difference that that ministry is making. And then Pastor Ken will come up and he will send us forth with a good word. Will you pray with me, please? Father, thank you so much for never letting us be complacent. You never have been for us. You've anticipated our needs and met them time after time. And so God, we wanna be a part of what you're doing in the world. Help us, Lord, to search our hearts, to hear your voice, and to do as you're prompting us to do, to not be afraid to go above and beyond, but to be a neighbor to our friends here locally, nationally, and internationally. And Lord, we will be sure to give you the thanks and the praise for the great things that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please direct your attentions to the screens. Mission of Yahweh is a women and children's homeless shelter. They bring in women who um, either for some reason lost their job and ended up homeless or um, whatever the circumstance may be, they go to Mission of Yahweh. At the Mission of Yahweh, we are a faith-based, non-denominational homeless shelter for women and children. We provide all of the necessities to get them to come in, live their life, and get back on their own um, in a good way. And they offer like classes for the women um, to help get them on their feet. They offer um, kind of like guidance as far as like how to get back up on their feet, what, like how to pay bills, how to do these things. It is faith-based. So the whole time that they're equipping these women, they're also equipping them with the gospel and like Jesus. This is our founder, Sister Helen Gay. Uh, we were founded in 1961. Um, she lived in a house much like the houses that you see around the neighborhood, just the real small houses. And she was taking in all the women and the children off of the street, housing them in such a small house. Um, and eventually one of the churches got word or a few churches got word of what she was doing and they built her the dormitory, which is the main building. Sister Gay started in her home, um, bringing people in and loving them and giving these women a safe place um, and feeding them. And it has grown and it is huge. And they are housing 150 people that they have to feed and clothe. Even just the basic needs have to be met. Faithbridge has been a, partnered, a partner of Mission of Yahweh for eight years, loving and serving the people there. And then I've had the opportunity to love and serve the people there for the last two. It was just like a calling from God because I grew up in homelessness. And so it was just really sweet to help minister to women and children with the background that I had. We have an emergency program. We have a two year transitional program and then we have our 60 plus senior program. So when you first come in, you get put into a dorm-like room. Either you're with somebody else or you're with your children. That's kind of what, what I like to call the emergency part. We do have our transitional shelter, which is this building here, the Mercy House Transitional. Our main goal, our, what we would say is our biggest goal is to have no recidivism. So that means getting these ladies everything that they need to be equipped for the world and not have to return. However, sometimes life happens, um, like hurricanes. There's nothing you can do about it if you lose your house in a hurricane. So um, it just really depends. It's all, all just different. Mission of Yahweh is like in the middle of just the impoverished. There's always a window. There's always a veil between, um, you know, people who have a little bit more and then people who have a little bit less. And I think. The more that we serve there and the more that we go there, that veil um, begins to tear or dissipate and we end up um, just being like brothers and sisters, like we're the same.
Well, I just want to add my uh, word of gratitude to the, what did he say, more than thousand of you going out and serving in places like Mission and Yahweh and all around the world and for your generosity. I hope you're doing the math. If you weren't, let me do it for you. So we're already on budget track to give away $1.2 million, but with this addition of 500, that'll be $1.7 million that we will give outside the walls of the church. And I think that's awesome. I'm excited about it. And I just want to invite you, especially if you have never made a gift here before, why don't you make this your first? You missed it today, but next week when Ben's here, let's next week, $20, $40, $100, or whatever it is, why don't you take your first step? All right, you be praying about that. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Go in peace. You're dismissed. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Good morning and welcome to Postscript. My name is Tyler Riley, high school pastor here at FaithBridge. I'm here with Pastor Dan Slagle, who kicked off our Above and Beyond series uh, with an incredible message um, on missions that are happening here locally, uh, nationally, and globally. Uh, so thanks for being with us here yeah, today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Figured we'd just jump right into some questions. Let's do it. Uh, so in the passage today, uh, you talked about uh, the parable with the Samaritan man on the side mm -hmm. of the road and how uh, two walked past and the last one chose to help. Uh, why is it significant in Scripture that Jesus would choose to use a Samaritan man? Why couldn't he just say, in general, just any man? Why? What was the significance of him being Samaritan? Right. So you need to understand, first of all, the relationship that the Israelites had with the Samaritans, and it was not a good one. In fact, you could say that the Israelites loathed the Samaritans. They considered them to be... Um, subhuman, wanted to have very little to do with them, you know, uh, e economic trans transactions were about the limit, but in terms of social interaction, none whatsoever. Jesus juxtaposes a Samaritan with two individuals that your typical Israelite would have held in very high esteem, uh, your Levite and your priest. And one of the reasons Jesus did that was to demonstrate that being a neighbor has nothing to do with your position or the amount of power that you occupy. N none of that matters to God. What matters to God is an individual who's willing to love somebody else selflessly. Even a Samaritan, even someone that you can't imagine would do something kind for an Israelite. Uh, and so Jesus is using that stark contrast to, to get that point across. That's good. Uh, and then the last thing you kind of announced today, uh, an above and beyond goal that we as a church yeah. have to raise $500,000 over the course of the next few weeks. Yep. Um, and so where could you direct people to give uh, maybe online or different ways that they can give to that goal? Sure. They can go online to faithbridge.org slash beyond. Uh, either their computer or use the app on their phone. Go to the drop-down uh, menu above and beyond, click on that, and then they can make their contribution. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, that's all I got. Thanks for being here with us today. Sure thing. Uh, and thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.